This is Glendale Cemetery, where some of Akron's wealthiest and most revered citizens are buried, along with other residents from a wide variety of socioeconomic backgrounds. Like most cemeteries, the grave sites are visited and cared for by surviving loved ones. What does Glendale Cemetery have in common with this Akron Park, known as Schneider Park? From the mid-19th to the early 20th century, bodies were buried here, too. Does anybody realize that? The residents who live here? The people who walk their dogs or take their kids to play sports here? Where are the grave sites? And why does no one care for them? Why have the people buried here been forgotten? Grass grows in unusual patterns at Schneider Park in West Akron. In certain areas, the earth has settled into a curious grid of ridges and hollows. Some secrets are buried forever in Akron's past, but others lie just beneath the surface. Are you talking about the graveyard path? Asked Ralph Witt, 84 of Akron, who grew up on Delia Avenue. That's the graveyard path. It cut through from Sunset View across Schneider Park and came out on Crest View there. When Witt was a boy, the park didn't exist. The land was a wild, muddy swamp, and some neighborhood children were afraid to go near it. That's where they buried the people, he said. I used to see bones every once in a while. They were sticking out of the ground. We collaborated with a local theater group called Theater on the Spectrum to produce this opening newsreel for their play along the graveyard path. Perfect. In 2012, Laura Valenza and I began teaching a drama class for kids on the autism spectrum. We knew that the arts could help kids learn their social skills, how to control emotions, and generally how to communicate better. And we developed the idea of theater on the spectrum. Now it's just not theater on the spectrum of autism. It's theater on the spectrum of all abilities. Yeah, I mean, we've been playing Thanksgiving football here on this field for about 15 years now. And then, yeah, a couple years ago, I found out about the whole bodies being buried underneath the football field. As far as, as I know, there, there are no plans for any, any kind of memorial or, or monument to commemorate, you know, what happened here. Why is it not disrespectful for uh, the residents, you know, to bring their, their dogs across here and, and defecate. You know, look at it like this, right? Like any other known cemetery or, or burial ground. Do you find other people playing soccer or football or, or driving cars? You know, just because there aren't headstones or markers doesn't mean it's not sacred ground. Michael Elliott, reference assistant at the Akron Summit County Public Library, has poured over funeral records sorted probate documents, and scanned death certificates in an ambitious effort to unearth infirmary history. Elliot decided to reconstruct the infirmary cemetery. So far, he has documented 300 infirmary burials from 1908 to 1916, plus 156 deaths from 1867 to 1908. Frankly, we don't even know the exact dimensions of the cemetery. The graves were never marked. If they were, it was with a wooden cross or something of that nature, which did not last. Body selling was a big problem, so Case Western, what at the time would have just been the Case Institute, was buying a lot of cadavers in the Northeast Ohio region. So what the doctors and the superintendents would do at the infirmary was they would just not write a death certificate and then just sell the body under the table. The graveyard path is reluctant to reveal its secrets. Who knows how many deaths never got recorded, Elliot said. One of the biggest challenges that historians face, just in general, has to do with when, you, when you're looking at the history of uh, groups of people who traditionally don't make the history books. Uh, the very people that we're often mo most interested in leave no paper trail. And so, yes, it's a, it's a very frustrating thing for historians. It makes it very difficult and very challenging. Uh, but 
On the other hand, these are stories that I think are so very important and really need to be told as, as imperfectly as we are able to tell them. The 15-acre park off Mole Avenue is one of the last vestiges of a 230-acre farm where the Summit County Infirmary operated for 70 years. Today, the quiet neighborhood has tree-lined streets, upscale homes, and well-kept lawns. In the 19th century, it was a shelter of last resort for the homeless, helpless, and hopeless. The common denominator, probably, of the people that lived there were, were people down on their luck. Uh, they had no money, they had no family, uh, no one to take care of them. Sometimes mental illness was a problem. Sometimes alcoholism was a problem. Usually it was someone who was totally destitute. In 1849, Summit County Commissioners paid $3,953 for Joseph McCune's 150-acre farm. Originally known as the County Poorhouse, the infirmary was a grim institution for destitute, elderly, or disabled people who had no place else to live. Its residents, who were called inmates, were required to work on the farm if they were physically able. The farmhouse and barns were remodeled to accommodate about 50 paupers. Over the decades, the county added buildings while buying more land. The farm was self-sufficient with grain from the field, fruit from the orchard, and meat from the slaughterhouse. In 1865, construction began on a $20,000 infirmary on the farm. This created uh, a lot of tension in the community because, uh, of course, this cost taxpayers money to, uh, to expand uh, these facilities. Uh, and this is, you know, Americans have never been really keen on raising their taxes. Uh, but on the other hand, they realized, well, you got to do something uh, with these people. At the opening ceremony in 1866, commissioners praised the building as an ornament and an honor to the county, and a mark on the exalted humanity and liberality of her people. Two years later, Inspector A.G. Byers begged to differ. In an 1868 report to the Ohio Board of State Charities, he described a hellish tour of the facility. Yeah, well, in general, uh, you never wanted to be in one of these places if you could possibly help it. Uh, and certainly if you came from the middle class, upper middle class, oftentimes you had an out. You had the ability to have someone care for you. You could be kept at home. Or there were private institutions uh, which took good care of, of people. These facilities were chronically underfunded which meant that there were a lot of corners cut. The conditions oftentimes were deplorable. Sanitary conditions were terrible, medical conditions were terrible, the food was terrible, and that's even, that's even if the institution is run by people who are really trying to do their best with the limited means to, at their hands. Uh, oftentimes, these institutions also suffered from the fact that there were people who were skimming money. Inside the building was an insane department with graded doors and cells Mentally ill individuals were locked away in squalid quarters. There were quite a number of filthy, insane, idiotic, and epileptic inmates, he wrote. A terrible stench permeated the entire building, he noted, and some inmates were kept in, quote, rude board pens. Oftentimes, people would have just been thrown into pest houses, which are basically um, quarantine facilities that at other infirmaries would have been used for if you had tuberculosis or something contagious, send them to the pest house so that they don't infect other people. But oftentimes they were used at Summit County Infirmary as a form of solitary confinement or a punishment. The investigations by um, the Ohio Board of Health uh, and the Ohio Board of Charities found that like women were being thrown in there naked for days on end. This was a rampant problem of abuse of power, both by the superintendents and the doctors.
A lot of people really didn't care what went on in the infirmary. These were people that oftentimes, like I said, were the parts of society that uh, most people really didn't associate with. Most people in, of course, the you know, middle class and above. Early on in the infirmary setting, people were defined as being mentally deficient, was a phrase that was used. Eventually, feeble-minded became used. Feeble-minded translated eventually into three categories of feeble-mindedness, idiot, imbecile, and moron. So idiots were um, people who had a behavioral age that appeared to be in the vicinity of two years old. Imbeciles were people with a behavioral age roughly in the vicinity of seven years old. And a moron was somebody who was fairly high-functioning with a behavioral age roughly around 12 years old. Insulting words where you describe people with disabilities. Oh, oh look who's coming. Uh, oh. <laughs> the insane ward um, would have included pretty much a lot of people that today we wouldn't consider needing institutional treatment. So this would have included everyone on the autism Asperger spectrum. I have autism and it makes me different. My brain processes differently. I am also on the spectrum. This is something a lot of people don't know about me. It's usually hard to talk about because I've always found it as a hindrance. This would have included people who had learning disabilities, so people with dyslexia could have ended up there, considered idiots. I was born with a cleft lip and a cognitive disorder. At school, they didn't know what to do with me. I wanted to be normal, but what is normal? The concept of insanity obviously is something that's very culturally constructed because insanity is basically just what is normal or culturally appropriate behavior and then what is not would be considered insane. Another big change that happened in the late 1800s was the advent of Darwinian thought. Charles Darwin publishes Origin of the Species in 1859 and whereas Darwin really mostly was trying to describe a biological principle, there were some people who thought Darwin's ideas could be transferred to human society. One of the most famous of these was a guy named Herbert Spencer. Spencer coined the term survival of the fittest. There are fit people and there are unfit people. And the unfit people, you can guess who they are. They're the people who are poor. They're the people who are indigent. They're the people who have some kind of disability. I was born with a cognitive disability. I was born with cerebral palsy. I was born profoundly deaf in both ears. I was born C-section premature. The nurse said I wouldn't survive, but here I am. This idea that the unfit were an increasing burden on society was driven by this, this so-called social Darwinism, that uh, we need to make sure that the unfit aren't going to swamp out the fit people in the population. And this becomes a really important principle underlying the, the subsequent eugenics movement. It, well, it's one of those alarming things where it can start to sound rational. It can sound rational until you really think it through the consequence of thinking this way has immediate, really immoral sequelae. But on top of that, then you look more carefully and the science is poor, the science is bad. We do not have science that substantiates a eugenical perspective. The threat of the feeble-minded to the eugenics crowd was that uh, these people aren't just dull. These people aren't just not very bright. They actually felt these people posed a threat. So physical disability, mental disability, and some form of immorality or criminality line up together. That is a package. Those things more often than not co-occur. Co and that for the sake of society, 
for the greater good, that we needed to not choose to bring that into the mix, but also for the sake of the child. I began volunteering with CADA two years ago and their project, Theater on the Spectrum. But like most people, I was shy at first. It can be difficult to get used to the way autistic people communicate. Hi, my name is Cyrus Shariari. Hi, I'm Jay Khan. Hi, I'm Jake Dietz. But after a while, I, I kept coming and coming and I began to talk with them. And I'd realized that they're just like I was. They went to the same movies I did. They had homework like I did. They had all the same thoughts. See, autism isn't a disability or a handicap. It's more like a different language, a different dialect. All of us, able-bodied and disabled, have something to add to the, to the experience of life. All of us experience the same joys and sorrow that life had to offer. All of us are people. The quicker we understand this, the quicker we move on from mistreatment or discrimination, and the quicker we move towards acceptance into society. In order to do the kinds of things that the eugenicists wanted to do, you actually needed the government to impose certain laws and certain strictures. And this then uh, affected things like county homes. Uh, the people who found themselves in county homes often were the destitute, the poor, the people that eugenicists felt were not the best people. If I lived then, I would be scared. I wouldn't know what might happen to me. I feel like disability rights now have improved so much over the past few years, but there's always more battle to be fought and won. I was bullied all throughout high school, and I want to do something to help stop bullying. In school, my teacher said I wouldn't amount to anything. She said I would be home with my parents for the rest of my life. I never thought a teacher would say that to me, but she did. Hereditary breeding for animals and hereditary breeding for humans lined up and then sorting people in infirmaries and this idea about some people needing to be isolated because they might be defective lined up so nicely with some of that eugenical thinking and this sort of behemoth of controlling the human population was unleashed. The late 1800s and 1880, we suddenly have an emphasis on controlling women. In an 1887 article titled Infirmary Horrors, Ohio Board of Charities Secretary A.G. Byers warns that the birth of a child to an insane mother at the Summit County Infirmary is not an isolated incident. For Byers, this Akron horror and other unwanted births at infirmaries around Ohio can only be prevented by achieving the complete separation of the sexes. They, they wanted to separate, segregate males from females. They didn't want any hanky-panky going on there. And to build enough institutions to house all the people that they viewed as feeble-minded or uh, unfit would have cost way too much money than uh, most people would be comfortable with. And they came up with what they viewed was a much more cost-effective measure and in, for some people, a much more efficient measure, and that was forced sterilization of people who they deemed were unfit and should not reproduce. The very first eugenic sterilization law was passed in Indiana in 1907, and then subsequently over the next few decades you have a number of states that passed these laws. And these laws would sterilize people without their consent. And then of course they could, felt that they could let them go and go back into the general population. They said this would free up bed space so you can bring in other people into the institutions which were already overcrowded. It made to them perfect eugenic sense and perfect economic sense uh, and a perfect sense from the point of efficiency. Over the course of the next few decades, more than 70,000 Americans were sterilized involuntarily across the country. The 
scientific thinking, scientific thinking behind eugenics is faulty. It is not valid genetics, it's not valid biology. And also very importantly, we value many, many more things about people than the surface traits that the eugenicists had chosen to identify. I realize that what makes me different, what makes me unique, is what drives my creativity, which makes me the better me. And it's something I feel like more people should embrace. And we should be able to talk about that more. Something that really annoys me is when you get put in the boxes. Like we are more than just a disability and we are more than just one thing. We're able to do so much more. We live outside the boxes. We live in multiple different boxes. We can excel in music. We can excel in our speech. Our thoughts are special. There's more to us than just that one thing. And I wish people would try to see that more. Akron's rapid growth led to the infirmary's demise. The city needed more land for housing. In 1915, Voters agreed to sell the farm and build the Summit County home in Monroe Falls. Philip H. Schneider, director of the Central Associated Realty Company, submitted the winning bid of $301,879 to develop the Sunset View subdivision. Schneider tore down the old infirmary, mapped out roads, and built fancy new homes. We never wanted it a part of our county seat. We never wanted it part of the community as something close because the idea was if it was in the county seat people could still participate in social functions and still be part of society instead of being ostracized. I am physically disabled. I have a congenital heart defect which leaves me with half a functioning heart. Mental disability or physical disability, disability in general, nothing to be stigmatized, nothing to be hidden away. Differences should be shared, differences should be celebrated because in the end that's what ties us together, is our differences. Nearly every block was developed except for a swampy area where the infirmary had buried its destitute. Some remains were to be exhumed and reburied in Monroe Falls. However, the later discovery of bones proved that the effort was far from exhaustive. When Schneider died in 1935, he deeded the land of the city, which built a park in his honor. Yeah, one of the things that I think was personally interesting to me about the whole Schneider Park project was exploring the concept of how we remember and forget as a community. Schneider was trying to make this into a place where people wanted to live. The focus had to move away from what was there. They've torn down all of the infirmary buildings, for example, in the hopes that people would eventually forget and let it be something entirely different. Well, in this play, I learned about the burials in Schneider Park without coffins or headstones. And I wish that we could do something to, to help honor those who were buried there. I think ultimately, when we look at something like this and we see that discrepancy from Glendale Cemetery to Schneider Park, and when we think about the fact that we don't know the names of the people with a few exceptions who are in the Summit County Infirmary and we don't know where their bones are, we've forgotten them. And they were marginalized during life and then they were erased at death. I think uh, one of the questions we sort of have to ask ourselves is what does it mean to be human? I never cared what people thought, but I have always been the type of person who could talk for myself. And every one of us with disability has something to say. We need to be heard. I want people with disabilities dreams to come true. My dream, I like to be on TV. Someday, I will work with the motion capture for movies and video games and work with Disney for animation. I know I will be successful in life because I already am. My goals in life are to be an actor, voice actor, producer, director, and writer. Look out, world, I'm on my way! Disability Throughout time Stories are in the bones, lasting storms. Hey, hey, hey.
No more. No more.